Um, welcome again to all of you who have joined us. Um, we're very happy to be here um, to discuss this very broad topic. Um, this session is being co-sponsored by CEPAS, by the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect, by the International Service for Human Rights, and by Human Rights Watch. And we have one um, panelist from each of these organizations. I would just like to introduce myself. I am Karina Gerlach, um, a senior advisor at the Center on International Cooperation at NYU. It's a profit. It's a nonprofit research center. Um, whose vision is to advance effective multilateral action to prevent crises, build peace, justice, and inclusion. Um, before that, I was with the UN for 31 years, um, dealing with many of the subjects that we're dealing uh, with today. I also happen to be a Venezuelan national. Um, so I um, really, if you look at um, the, the concept note, really set out the issues very, very well. And it is a huge, it is a very, very broad agenda that we have here today because we're not only dealing with women, peace and security, we're dealing with um, the fact-finding mission that just came out with its report earlier this year. We're dealing with the role of the United Nations and also the humanitarian crisis. All of these are interrelated, but each and every one of them could take a couple of hours of discussion. So we're going to, I, I, I'm welcoming the panelists to speak from seven to 10 minutes and um, also to speak slowly, please, um, so that our interpreter can manage the interpretation. Um, and I think that all of the issues will be well covered by the panelists. So without further ado, let me give the floor um, to Bibi Borges from CEPAS, the Center for Justice and Peace. And she'll be speaking to the situation of women's rights in the framework of the complex humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Over to you, Bibi. Okay, thank you, Karina, and good morning, everybody. Well, this week we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the resolution 1325, which remind us the, the importance of women for the peace and security in, of our countries. And as mentioned yesterday in the, in the Security Council debate, equality between men and women in decision-making is the only way we will build peace. 20 years ago, when resolution 1325 was approved, I live in a country with challenges in the recognition of women's rights, but with democracy. Venezuela was a host country for migrants and refugees because of its freedom, democracy, and living condition. Today, and at least since 2015, we are going through a complex humanitarian emergency that is not the result of armed conflict or natural disaster, but has the same consequence. Venezuela is a devastated country, not because of war, but because of the loss of democratic institutions, the rule of law, and the political crisis. As the consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now facing a double crisis, a double nightmare, and the situation is getting worse every day. This crisis is not only affected peace and security in our country, but has also had great impact on Latin America. Today, more than 5 million Venezuelans have, 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 have to desperately leave the country in order to secure their survival. Now, because of the COVID, we see how the departure of Venezuelan will continue to increase. The ones who are living now are those left behind. There are women and children who cannot survive in the conditions of the country. Human suffering is much that Venezuela, Venezuelans prefer to risk their life walking, walking, walking thousands of kilometers than staying in the country. There are refugees in need of international protection. Something we have learned in the humanitarian crisis are never gender neutral. Part of the discussion today is how this humanitarian crisis connect with the spirit contained in the women's peace and security agenda. It is important to highlight that women face a specific and differentiated challenges that can only be experienced, described, and addressed by them. 
promoting women's participation at all levels must be a priority when developing adequate response to the impact of the crisis, but also to finding long-term solution to the political conflict driven by the humanitarian emergency and the increased migration. This is not happening in Venezuela, even though women are those who are facing the crisis with the greatest resilience. There are leaders in their communities. They are the one who make the difference and the one who carry the weight of the crisis on their shoulders. They are not being priority, prioritized in the response. We see this every day in the work that surpassed us with God fruit women in Petare, the greatest slum in Caracas. In the Venezuelan context, women are affected in different and aggravating way. We have a rise in maternal mortality, teenager pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections, malnutrition in pregnant women, Violence, violence against women, femicides, among others. We know this thanks to the civil society monitoring and documenting work because there is not official data available. We have regresses, decades of develop. Public service are collapsed. There is no gas, water, electricity, or internet in our country. A woman in Venezuela cannot buy a menstrual pad or contraceptive either because they are not available or because they cannot afford them. One of the great difficulties we have in Venezuela is the opening of the humanitarian space and the expansion of the capacity of civil society and especially women's organization for humanitarian assistance. Other difficulties are the persecution and attacks of those who demand the rights. The recent report of the fact-finding mission show the commission of serious human rights violations and international crimes. The commission of sexual violence and the gender dimension of the crisis is reflected through different aspects to the report. Elizabeth is gonna talk more about that. Although the vast majority of the execution and detention were perpetrated against men, at this nature, uh, of this nature were also verified against women. And women were also affected in the context of the perpetration of these executions and detentions. It is mostly women who seek justice for this serious crime. They don't know find independent or impartial institution. They have no access to justice. And it is very important that the new extension of the mission mandates include the dimension of gender and sexual violence. This is an important step for justice with gender perspectives. Despite this difficult context, there's still a civil society, human rights defendants and women's leader who don't give up. That is why the support of the international community for women is so essential in Venezuela. Supo supporting women's leader on the ground with humanitarian assistance and in the defense of human rights is crucial. Women are also essential in the process of rebuild democracy. Unfortunately, in most of the di discussions about Venezuelan crisis and negotiations at the national and international level, level, the panelists are men. There is still much to do and many people and women to help in my country. There is a recognition of 7 million people in need in Venezuela and 5 million migrants and refugees by the crisis. There is humanitarian needs inside Venezuela and outside Venezuela. 7.9% of the people in Venezuela, that is 2.3 million, are severely food insecure. And this is even worse because of the COVID. 96% live in poverty with deficient best basic service. Last week, the platform of civil society called Home Venezuela estimate that of all population with humanitarian needs, there is between 10 million and 80 million of people in different groups with necessity of humanitarian assistance in Venezuela. It's urgent to develop a women's peace and security agenda for Venezuela. The women's peace and security, security pillars, participation, conflict prevention, protection, and recovery and relief should be thought and worked in the Venezuelan case. The activities which shall be prioritized are 
raising awareness and build common understanding on the importance of the full and effective participation of women in all decision-making levels, the assessment and response to the differentiated impact of the humanitarian crisis and the political conflict on women and girls, and the role and contribution of women in the peaceful democratic, democratic and the negotiate solution in the conflict. As long civil society and women continue to work in the humanitarian, human rights and political crisis, there is hope for Venezuela. To achieve peace and security in Venezuela is to guarantee the human right of Venezuelans. International organizations and especially the UN have a key role contributing with, to this. I'm very glad that today we can discuss it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bibi. Um, first, thank you for that incredible intervention and thank you for everything you do um, with your organization. As you pointed out, um, the humanitarian crisis is multidimensional and has disproportionately affected women um, who are not being included in any kind of solutions. Um, and we can discuss this um, later, but thank you for that very comprehensive briefing on what is a, a, a very dire situation and only likely to become more so. Um, let me now call on Elizabeth Pamendorfer, who will speak to us um, on the, oh, for, sorry, from the <coughs> Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect, who will speak to us on the implications of the report of the in, inter, Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on the Defense of Women Rights. The floor is yours, Elizabeth. Welcome. Thanks, Karina. Thanks a lot. Um, a warm hello to my dear colleagues and friends on the panel. It's uh, it's a real honor um, to be in this conversation with all of you. And of course, many thanks to everyone behind the scenes who is bringing us together and making sure this conversation goes smooth. Um, most of the audience may uh, in fact already be aware of um, the kind of key findings of the report of the independent fact finding mission um, which were presented um, in September this year. Um, these key findings are that there are widespread and systematic patterns of state-led violence and they may in fact amount to crimes against humanity. Now we are specifically talking about crimes like murder, imprisonment, torture, rape and other forms of sexual violence and forced disappearances and other inhuman acts <clears throat> which are causing great suffering. And all of this, um, which uh, the fact-finding mission established is part of a state policy with responsibility at the highest level. We're talking about presidential ministerial level, but also leadership of intelligence and security. But the fact-finding mission um, also drew specific attention to the gender impact of violations and abuses and the differentiated impact suffered by women specifically. And this is something that is felt through all spheres of, of daily life, which, which Bibi just um, elaborated on. Um, it includes, of course, sexual violence, both against women and men. This is well documented in the report. It's horrifying to read, but it includes, you know, rape, but also, you know, being forced to listen to the rape of others. It includes sexual harassment, public humiliation of rape victims. All of this, is being used as a form of you know, degrading, humiliating, punishing victims, but also it's used as a technique of repression and torture. But in addition to sexual violence, what the report also really does in great detail is it documents, for example, conditions in detention. We're talking about um, oftentimes unofficial detention centers where women um, are don't have access to water, they are denied access to menstrual hygiene products, um, they face incredible risks of sexual exploitation. Um, if they're being raped and sexually harassed, there's also no, um, there's no contraception available, there's no access to any form of sexual or reproductive health. Um, and in addition to that, as kind of an indirect consequence. Oftentimes women are the ones that have to provide for family members that are in detention. And this is putting incredible restraints on uh, resources which are already extremely scarce. Um, the list goes on and, and Bibi also mentioned the issue of um, women um, that are being, uh, you know, 
they're referred to as secondary victims of extrajudicial executions where they have to sometimes witness family members being executed or they're being beaten or removed from their homes. Um, they're being threatened by law enforcement officials. These are just a few examples of the very detailed information that is in the report. And I think we have to consider specifically that all of this is taking place in a context of pervasive impunity. There's no support for victims, there's stigmatization, there's of course an absolute lack of trust in law enforcement officials, and there's a very serious and a very realistic fear of reprisals. And so this means that in addition to the report and the information that is in the report, a lot of the cases are actually underreported because women are supposed to report to the perpetrators. Um, a last point I also want to make is that um, when we talk about uh, sexual violence, gender-based violence, these violations leave scars on bodies, but not only. They affect mental well-being, they affect every aspect of family life and of societal relationships. And trauma is not only experienced by victims, but also by relatives and by family. So there is really an interconnected range of problems, and I think it does require um, an interconnected approach. I think taking all of that into consideration, I feel it leaves the question of, well, what, what can we as an international community do to understand and address um, this need for a systematic inclusion of a gender lens to responding to situations where patterns of human rights violations and abuses and possible atrocity crimes are being committed. And I wanna give three brief examples. Um, we've heard them many times before. It includes the systematic inclusion of a gender lens to fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry and, and other investigative mechanisms. It absolutely includes that we need to hold perpetrators of sexual and gender-based violence um, accountable on an international and national level. But we also need a survivor-centered approach, which really prioritizes the rights and the needs of victims. Um, I think this would be a good starting point. But then, you know, I think in addition to all of this, and this is something I realized when I wrote my remarks as well, is that all of these measures I just listed, they actually come in the aftermath of atrocity crimes. And this um, made me also realize again that with many atrocity situations that we at the Global Center are also monitoring around the world, um, there is really a need for a um, systematic uh, gender lens to early warning systems you know, um, data collection and monitoring, greater gender expertise in making risk assessments, not only in the aftermath, but in the process of prevention and immediate response. And the fact-finding mission touches upon this, which is really interesting. It mentions the way in which previously existing gender stereotypes and inequalities have actually been weaponized in the context of these patterns of, of um, violations and abuses. So looking at structural risk factors with such a gender lens, I think is really important for holistic prevention measures. Um, I wanna get to the end of my remarks for now, but um, something I really wanna emphasize is, you know, when we look at um, including such a gender lens to the prevention of atrocities and, and making WPS a reality, um, I think we also need to understand, as Bibi mentioned, uh, we need to understand, we need to recognize, and we need to promote that women are not only victims, they are powerful agents of change. We don't have to become these agents, we already are. We are agents of resistance, protection, prevention, and we have to be at the center of any discussion on every level, because this is what re will really allow us to establish a holistic gender sensitive assessment of effective prevention strategies. So I think it's not only important to have conversations on gender sensitivity, but we also have to be very honest and very, um, we have to question with whom are we having these conversations? Because there are so many aspirational, incredible women in Venezuela and abroad who are not only aspirational as human beings and human rights activists and humanitarians, but who are aspirational as decision makers, powerful stakeholders, and who right now are working towards peace and justice in Venezuela. So on an international level and, and me, you know, being based in Geneva, I think instead of planning policies in, in, in very, you know, fancy multilateral high level for us, what we need to do is we need to actually listen and we need to take note. And I'm gonna finish here, but I wanna take this opportunity to actually um, draw everyone's attention to a video that was shared on the Twitter account of CEPAS, I believe. Um, uh, yesterday evening in which um, Feliciano Reina is, is, uh, is giving a very, very powerful speech on, 
on women um, and their role in, in finding a solution to the crisis in Venezuela. So everyone, um, please, please check that out. 10 minutes, um, very, very well invested. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for this uh, really wonderful summary, actually, um, with a gender lens of the fact-finding mission, which really did an extraordinary job of not only interviewing, but of documenting in such detail all of the atrocities, and particularly and specifically those um, against women. And of course, the whole issue of impunity is when it's state-sponsored terrorism or abuse is, is something that is very serious and, and very despairing in many ways because there's nowhere to go, right? There's no, there are no institutions and our institutions are broken. And if it were not um, for organizations like CEPAS and others who consistently are there to try to uh, give a helping hand, um, it would be even more dire. Um, you mentioned the interconnected approach, which I think that we have to look at not only um, in prevention, but also in the solutions. And um, also the responsibility of the international community, especially when, when um, the fact-finding mission has talked about crimes against humanity. But I guess Louis will get into that subject a little bit later as we, um, as we progress in the conversation. Um, I would really like to, to, to welcome now Eleanor Openshaw from the International Service for Human Rights, who will speak to the role of United Nations bodies in repairing damages and restoring the rights of Venezuelan women in the context of the complex humanitarian emergency in Venezuela. The floor is yours, Eleanor. Karina, thanks so much. Um, and greetings to everybody who's who's joining the conversation and, and uh, everybody on the panel. Um, in particular, thanks to Thibbath for uh, bringing us all together um, today. Um, so I would start by saying that the, the fact-finding mission, um, the establishment of the mission and the recent renewal of the mandate for another couple of years is, is a major achievement by Venezuelan human rights um, activists, and I think has done something very important, which is um, provide um, an echo to what so many have been saying for so long. Uh, and an important piece of the work of the fact-finding mission has been to demand that those, uh, those accounts be heard in the biggest human rights space in the world, the Human Rights Council. And that is an is absolutely um, vital step forward, I think. Um, so essentially what I'm going to focus on here is a little bit in regard to the follow-up to the fact-finding mission renewal and what is on track in that regard, and then cast my eye a little further afield in regard to what other possibilities there are to try to amplify what the fact-finding mission has and hopefully will continue to provide us in terms of uh, data and findings and recommendations and how as civil society actors we can try to push this forward so that we are constantly amplifying and reinforcing what the discussion that is being had and tapping into other spaces which I hope can help us elevate some of the political pressure so that we move as fast as possible to, toward that ultimate aim of holding perpetrators to account and seeing human rights change in, in Venezuela as swiftly and efficiently as possible. So we know that the fact-finding mission renewal that was confirmed uh, or approved uh, by the council in September has to go through a couple of loops in New York through uh, human rights and financial committees um, we are hoping that that's on track, that the, the mission would start working with a bit of luck um, early uh, next year. There's an established track then in regard to the decision by the council um, of a focus on Venezuela at the council in Geneva from here until September 2021. That we know. We know that the fact-finding mission produced a bank of recommendations and findings, including uh, with a focus on gender and the gender impact of violations. And we know that the new mandate um, for the next two years, the work of the, of the mission um, has been enhanced. And so now specifically includes the fact that the mission should focus its attention and inquiry um, on um, 
violations, including those involving sexual and gender-based violence. So they had been doing that work, but now that is very much an explicit part of what they have been directed to do. I think it's also important to note that the fact-finding mission, of course, within the constellation of the UN bodies, is not the only one who's been doing this work, of investigating, monitoring, and reporting on questions that relate to sexual and gender-based violence. The Office of the High Commissioner, now, of course, into its second year of work um, in Venezuela, has now for some years, both in official uh, uh, reports that have been requested of it and in, in reports that it prepared itself, been looking at these questions of sexual assaults on demonstrators, uh, gender stereotyping in the legal system, um, gender-based violence, and doing it not only through an understanding of these as failures and violations in their own rights, but the ways in which th these kinds of attacks contribute to the weakening of democratic systems and institutions, inclu including through the generation of a lack of trust in in those very institutions. So we have a bank of recommendations that have come through from the fact-finding mission from the Office of the High Commissioner. We know that Venezuela will be on the agenda of the council for every session from March, 2021 to March, 2022 with the final fact-finding mission report due in September, 2022. So the question here with the, with the fact-finding mission and the office is how to keep these threads of work and inquiry um, distinct but complementary, reinforcing each other in, as Elizabeth said, a, an attempt to create something holistic, some sort of overall UN strategy, which is talking about um, a, re a, a multi-pronged UN, UN strategy on Venezuela that addresses the human rights and humanitarian crises in the country. So as we think about the, the, the current uh, track of work, what else could we be doing? What else could we be thinking about um, to try to build upon what is already happening? So I just cast my eye maybe to New York. We know so much of this action recently has been happening in Geneva within the Human Rights Council. What might be done if we were looking to try to plug some of this stuff into existing and potentially new agendas within New York. So a very quick, uh, a very quick overview. Um, so the third committee um, is the, uh, the New York Human Rights Committee. It's part of the General Assembly. Um, um, it is noticeable, I think, that the, um, the, uh, those who have pushed the um, fact-finding resolution in uh, the council did not choose to include um, a, an article uh, requesting that the fact-finding mission report to the General Assembly. That is something that has been included um, in resolutions for other fact-finding missions. And that might be something to look to in the future, how to ensure that the conversation that's primarily ha been happening at the council actually find a platform as part of the official agenda in New York. That's just another way of getting the findings and recommendations aired, having people in New York, the decision makers become more informed and astute and wise about the challenges and hopefully then better able to figure out how to use the system to push some of this stuff forward, including the Security Council, which of course, um, Lou will speak to briefly, um, uh, just, just after me, I believe. Um, so the th third committee is a, way, is a place where you could look to push another resolution. I would say at this point, there's nothing that you would be doing there particularly because the principal game at the moment is around the Human Rights Council fact-finding mission. But it is, it is um, another space that I think for the future, it would be interesting to consider in terms of possibilities for discussing human rights um, violations in Venezuela. The second body that meets in New York, the Commission on the Status of Women. Of course, this is a forum where many of the questions that the fact-finding mission and others have highlighted would find a natural home. Um, the agenda for CSW uh, for the upcoming year 
does focus on two questions that are highly pertinent given what the fact-finding mission has identified, as Elizabeth also noted. Um, the uh, upcoming uh, priority theme for the commission will be on participation and decision-making for women and the elimination of violence. And there are sort of a series of options, primarily I would say around raising awareness and trying to plug some of these findings into some other uh, some other strands of discussion and decision making, but that's another possibility. I'm going to just highlight two more things and then just uh, come to a conclusion. Um, of course, the whole system of special procedures is absolutely an essential part, I think, of this monitoring reporting UN facility um, and highly complementary to what is already happening. Now, the big challenge for us, of course, in regard to Venezuela, and it's not unique to Venezuela by any means, is that um, they have for many years not wished to meet with special procedures, special rapporteurs, as they're called, or independent experts, um, unless they are um, some of the experts that are, I'm going to say are not the most hard hitting in terms of thematic um, 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 thematic foci. Um, and so I think uh, an area that's interesting always to look at is how to um, encourage the special procedures, even if they cannot get into the country, even if they're not allowed access, how do you get them individually and maybe as a collective in some regard to focus attention on the human rights situation in Venezuela with a particular strand on the question of gender, gender-based violence. There's potential there for sure, I would say. And the final uh, process uh, that I'd highlight in terms of the New York world is the um, high level political forum. This falls um, as part of the Agenda 2030. Um, this is um, another space, I suppose, where you have other possibilities of trying to bring your agenda to bear on um, I'd say the sort of primary at this point, the primary UN agenda and um, Agenda 2030 has a goal that relates to gender equality and the empowerment of women. So again, there are various options that we could talk about in, in more detail if people are interested in how you can engage effectively, but there are possibilities there. So um, the final body, of course, which is critical is the Security Council and we will, will address this. So just as a final, final uh, reflection, um, as other speakers, as uh, Bibi and um, Elizabeth have noted, um, key to all of this work of um, pushing for the UN to, um, uh, to promote understanding and promote the articulation of coherent and effective responses to a situation such as Venezuela, key to all of that is the work of civil society. None of this happens without the push of people like th those we've already named, like the Venezuelan human rights um, defenders and, and, and allies. Um, and so I think it's always key to keep talking about how do we open doors so that those who know most about the challenges in Venezuela speak directly to those who we need to make clever, smart, efficient, urgent decisions to bring the weight of the UN machinery to bear and to bring about the, 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 the changes that we, that we seek. So let me leave it there. And um, thanks so much for this opportunity. I look forward to any questions there may be. Thanks, Karina. Thank you so much, Eleonora, for that really interesting um, expose about actually bringing the issues from Geneva um, and this uh, fantastic report of the fact-finding mission to New York and the opportunities, but also some of the difficulties. And if I could just insert a little personal note, um, in the years I spent in the Department for Political Affairs, um, one of the great frustrations was the difficulty of bringing attention to the Venezuelan situation, which of course um, uh, has become very politicized in New York. I'm sure that Lou will speak to that. Um, but always thinking that we, we must try to push on civil society um, those who are very involved at a technical, a more technical level in, in Geneva um, to push those in New York, their counterparts in New York, that even if it's uh, more political 
And in the end, the United Nations is an organization of member states and it will only move if member states push it to move. So we have to keep that in mind always when trying to, to get the system to go behind any kind of strategy. But at any rate, um, Lou is the expert on this. So let me ask him um, to speak to the, rule of the, the role of the Security Council and the crisis in Venezuela. Welcome, Lou, the floor is yours. Thanks, Karina, and thanks to everyone on the panel, and particularly Sapaz for organizing this. It's um, very timely, and um, I'll get right to the point. So I'm going to talk about the Security Council, not so much what it does, but what it, it isn't doing, but uh, the potential that we have, even if it's not doing anything, that doesn't mean that it's not an important forum that we're going to look to. So I want to um, first sort of take a look at the uh, overall situation in Venezuela and um, focus on the COVID-19 situation, which is central to people's lives there as it is for all of us and everyone around the world these days. Um, the situation of COVID-19 in Venezuela is extremely problematic and it's something that we at Human Rights Watch in cooperation with Johns Hopkins University have been focusing on for a long time. We first did a report last year that we published in April on the overall humanitarian situation. Um, that report was the result of a year-long investigation involving testimony and data. And now we've really been focusing heavily on the situation with COVID-19. So let me say first that the pandemic has provided a perfect excuse for the Venezuelan authorities to crack down on critics and opponents. I mean, this is something that the fact-finding missions, um, findings have made um, painfully clear. Uh, President Maduro established a state of emergency and alarm that authorizes security forces to carry out inspections whenever and wherever they deem necessary. If there is what they call a reasonable suspicion that someone's violating the decree, um, we've seen that the quarantine measures uh, you know, have been enforced by the military which is really not something that we expect in a, in a normal situation. Um, not that the situation there is normal, but um, it's certainly the, the it's, it's just provided an excuse for increasing um, human rights abuses. Um, so uh, one, let me give a few statistics on the situation in um, uh, Venezuela with um, the humanitarian state. So um, as of September 24th, uh, there were just under 70,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Venezuela and 574 deaths. And that's according to Johns Hopkins University. Um, we are quite certain that the number of actual cases is much higher than that. We know that health workers have very little uh, uh, protection. There isn't PPE and the situation is critical. Um, health workers are exposed, they're dying. This is taking place in a situation where there is a lack of water and 7 million people in the country are in need of humanitarian assistance. Um, so uh, we also have a, the, the Venezuelan health system has been really hobbled by years of infrastructure decay, shortages of medicine um, and supplies, severe water shortages. It doesn't have the capacity to deal with COVID-19 and care for patients and protect the healthcare workforce. And this lack of capacity, the dilapidated system that they have is the result of, of um, 
the mishandling of the government that preceded the sanctions that have you know, likely made the situation more complicated. Um, the humanitarian emergency predates those things, though obviously we are watching closely the impact of the sanctions and have urged governments, you know, particularly the US and the EU to make sure that, that whatever they do doesn't make things uh, unnecessarily um, uh, complicated, doesn't worsen the situation for people, which was bad before we don't need to make it worse. Um, so uh, one of the things that we've been seeing is now that, that um, around 130,000 citizens, uh, Venezuelan citizens have re been returning to other countries and treated in a way that we consider is abusive and likely to amplify the transmission of COVID-19. Um, for today's discussion, this is particularly important because many of the people returning who are put into abusive lockdown situations are women. Many of them are pregnant. They're returning um, from Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, often on foot um, in very bad condition. And the situation is extremely difficult for them. Now, this is something that we've highlighted uh, in our own research, and I will post a link that includes a video that I recommend uh, people watch. It's um, not easy watching, but, but I do think it, it, it really drives home the point of how difficult things are. So this brings me back to the uh, original point that I wanted to touch on, which is the Security Council. So what has the Security Council done on Venezuela? Well, ultimately it hasn't done anything. As, as we know, the Security Council is paralyzed on Venezuela as it is on so many issues. And this is because uh, at least two members of the Security Council that hold vetoes have essentially hijacked it. And so in, because of their disagreements um, and the fact that they support uh, different factions in the crisis, um, there's no way that they're going to let the council do anything. Does that mean that the council has no role to play? Not at all. Even if the council is incapable of, of, of taking any decisions, it's important that it stay on top of the issues. And sometimes just holding a meeting can send uh, strong messages to all of the players. I'll give you an example. Last year in April, the Security Council held a meeting on the humanitarian situation in Venezuela. Well, the council didn't do anything. There was a lot of finger pointing. There, was, there were uh, accusations from Russia, from the US and from other uh, council members. Um, there were denials from the Venezuelan government. But afterwards, the Venezuelan government quietly worked with the UN to enable it to, at least on some level, begin the kind of scale up of humanitarian assistance um, uh, somewhat in line with what we and other organizations that have been following the situation there have called for. So sometimes just having a meeting can have an impact. Uh, so fortunately though, even if the Security Council is incapable of taking decisions and, you know, it, there are other UN bodies that are not handicapped in, in the way that uh, the Security Council is. They don't have a veto. The Human Rights Council is perhaps the best example of, I won't go into the fact-finding missions, findings those have already been uh, discussed by others, but as Eleanor said, it, re it really is the focus of our advocacy these days because um, it's so important that the fact-finding mission be able to continue working to gather evidence of crimes uh, so that hopefully someday there will be accountability. And even if the Security Council is incapable of living up to its responsibility to help ensure capability, uh, to help ensure accountability, um, at least we have the Human Rights Council uh, uh, 
pushing its investigation so that evidence can, can be gathered. And I should add that even though Venezuela is on the Human Rights Council, which, it, which shouldn't be the case, but unfortunately it is, it was elected last year. That was something that we and other organizations uh, openly opposed, but they, they, they squeaked onto the Human Rights Council by a hair. They were unable to stop the extension of the mandate of the fact-finding mission. So this isn't something that we're used to in New York where uh, somebody's always able to block things. Fortunately, that's not the case there. I should also say that, that the, um, the UN humanitarian response, um, they've been, uh, as I said, scaling up. We need them to scale up more. Um, they need to, uh, they, they need support from UN member states. Um, and we need to make sure that the support is being delivered in an, uh, in an equitable manner, that there's monitoring of the way that humanitarian aid is done on the ground so that the women, the children, the elderly, and others who really need uh, assistance on the ground are getting it and that it's not being channeled to those who support the Maduro government. Um, so I think I will end there and just make a final point that even though the Security Council is so often paralyzed and we, we saw that it took months for the council to say anything on COVID-19, arguably the biggest international security crisis that we're face, that we were facing, are facing, and will continue to face. Um, that doesn't mean that we're just going to walk away from the Security Council, even though it causes us to roll our eyes. Um, they need to keep. They need to keep trying to at least discuss things. They could have an ARIA meeting, for example, an informal meeting, bring the fact-finding mission to New York, and um, at least have a discussion. Germany and the Dominican Republic held a high level meeting in July. Uh, it was very well attended to talk about the need for states to um, uh, make sure that aid is going to the right places in line with the kinds of recommendations that I was making uh, a moment ago. Um, so we need to keep talking about it. We need to keep talking about it in public. Uh, we have to keep our expectations for the Security Council low while focusing on where we can achieve very concrete things like at the Human Rights Council. And with that, back over to the organizers of the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Vu, for clarifying and for explaining uh, well what the UN Security Council can or cannot do in its present state um, and where we could possibly put our efforts. Um, and that's something that I'd like to, well, first of all, let me just say that we do have the question and answer function. So if anybody would like to in the audience, if anybody would like to ask um, any of the panelists questions, please send them to us. In the meantime, I just wanted to do uh, to give a follow up to ask a follow up question myself actually to start out, and that is um, just to comment on what Lou was saying. Um, the UN humanitarian response has been considered um, quite inadequate and very long in coming to Venezuela. Um, uh, as I said before, I was involved in these issues, and to our great frustration, we could not. Um, get them to, to recognize. And of course, the government was saying that there wasn't a humanitarian crisis. And even so, um, Ocha at this point is extremely frustrated because of the humanitarian appeal. So little has been, has been paid. And not only that, but I would say that the countries surrounding Venezuela are also very frustrated because the appeal that they made with the European Union has not been funded at all. And I would say, and maybe we could speak, I could ask this of all of the panelists. Um, and that is, you know, what, how, how, where do we put the pressure? Um, and also to, to, to make sure, I think, you know, the Grupo de Lima is, is, is I don't, I wouldn't say defunct, but, but um, is suffering, let's put it that way, because of uh, political divisions. And I think that 
we need to bring to bear the, the strength of some of the delegations in Geneva in keeping this alive to New York. The, the, the agenda in New York is so huge that many times the delegations, even those that are interested because I have spoken to them, um, are not very aware of what's happening to, to Geneva. So I think that's one of the places where we have to put pressure. I think, for example, some of these meetings that you're talking about, Lou, of information, bringing information to delegations here in New York and bringing the fact-finding mission would be a, a, a fantastic thing to do. But I wonder if you could, all of you could speak to some other instances where we could, the third committee is not enough. <coughs> and it's only one out of, 150 items at least, um, so it won't really get a good day. So the, my question is really, where is the pressure? And since we're talking about crimes against humanity in the fact-finding mission, what is the role and could anybody speak about the International Court of Justice? Because that, that is a question also to be brought forth. Would any would Lou? Would you like to try it again? Yeah, let me, I'll I'll take up the first part of that question. I mean, this is something that we've been grappling with, and I think your your question is spot on, and it's one that we've been wrestling with now for uh, uh, over a year and a half. Um, what we've settled on is that I and I I think you really nailed it there. Um, we need UN leadership. Um, when you have a situation where the humanitarian response has become so uh, um, incredibly politicized, the only way to depoliticize it is to um, hand it to the experts. And the experts in this case you know, are really the United Nations. Um, and um, whether it's the uh, WHO and the uh, Pan American Health Organization dealing with COVID, or OCHA dealing with the overall humanitarian response, we need to see the Secretary General um, and the uh, UN Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, really take charge of the efforts and send a message to the world that they're going to oversee and, and, and lead and show leadership in a depoliticized response. Um, you're completely right that the response has been inadequate I mean, this is a point that we've been making and trying to make and, and others have been making as well. And, you know, the UN, um, I think that, that they would respond and say, well, we need to work with the government to ensure that we have access. Yes, that's true, but they're often walking on eggshells, I feel. And the important point that I, I made about the Security Council when they discussed the humanitarian situation um, in a way that I think for the Venezuelan government was perhaps somewhat humiliating uh, where so many members of the council were describing the horrific situation on the ground there. Um, instead of the Venezuelan government kicking out the UN, which is what senior UN officials were afraid of, they actually did the opposite and they took a step back and they said, okay, and they allowed the appointment of a, of a um, uh, humanitarian coordinator. Uh, and they started to take some steps which were not enough, but went in the right direction. So I would say putting the pressure on those who have influence over the various parties in Venezuela, particularly the government. I mean, we all know that Russia has a great deal of leverage and they should be doing a lot more, I mean, we need to obviously keep our expectations realistic if the Russian government isn't going to go in the direction that we want it to go. But certainly we need to tell them to push the Maduro government to adopt all measures that ensure aid and all humanitarian assistance reaches Venezuelan people where they need it. The US, um, uh, the UN leadership itself, as I said, the European Union, the Lima Group, and all those who have influence over um, various parties and the authorities in Venezuela need to push them to open up to a full scale UN led response, um, allow full access to the World Food Program and its partners who have the logistical capacity to provide significant amount of humanitarian aid nationwide um, to make sure that this arrangement with the 
Pan American Health Organization is um, implemented to enable local in, and international humanitarian workers to get aid and to have access to hospitals and healthcare centers, and then to allow healthcare professionals and humanitarian workers to carry out their work without reprisals. I mean, this is one of the things that the people who are trying to help are often facing reprisals. They're not allowed to move freely in Venezuela. They're harassed. They're, they're sometimes uh, arrested, particularly we've seen this with the um, uh, COVID-19 quarantines. So they're, they need to have you know, permits that are respected by the authorities. They need to have access to gasoline. And then we need, we need uh, independent experts to be able to um, have access to the data um, the Venezuelan government has been covering up and withholding data um, so that we don't know what the humanitarian situation is, what the COVID-19 situation is. So these are kinds of concrete things that we could be doing. And sorry, that was a long answer to a short question, but um, uh, thank, you very much. Pick it up. <laughs> thank you very much. That's, that's very useful. <clears throat> and I think the main point here is is that even though we all agree that this the Venezuelan the Venezuelan crisis is an issue for international peace and security, maybe the best way because of the politicization of getting this through to people is <clears throat> through the humanitarian and through the technical and <clears throat> oh excuse me and the the evidence base that we have with the fact finding mission because you know this is not about left or right. Um, this is about what's happening to the Venezuelan people and the more that we can push this. And that's the same thing that I would say um, in terms of Eleanor and, and, and like, for example, the HLPF would normally not want to deal with something that's political, right? Um, but when it comes to women, uh, you know, the, the situation of women, you could go in through that route. Same thing for the CSW, correct? So, so that's how we have to be strategic, I believe. But um, would anybody else like to speak to this issue, Eleanor, Elizabeth, or Bibi? Well, just uh, to add, uh, so for uh, Louis said uh, about the how the UN uh, should be uh, do this technical work because um, they estimate that seven millions in in necessity, but from civil society, as I said in my presentation, we see uh, between. 10 million and 80 million in different groups in necessity. And something important is not uh, quantify the necessity for the capacity, is quantify the necessity for the need. And this is important because uh, even if you don't have the capacity, you cannot forget that it's people dying and suffering. And you have to try to move all your uh, capacities and materials and resources to help people and say what is the real uh, necessity that is in Venezuela. Um, know about the capacity is about the needs. And also, I think it's important to highlight the many uh, international donors think that a civil society cannot the capacity inside of Venezuela. And I think this is important to, to support international and national civil society to do the humanitarian work. This is a, a way to despoliticize the, the, the humanitarian assistance. Thank you so much, Bibi. Um, um, Eleanor. Um, so maybe just two very quick thoughts. I, so essentially, I think you need to get to the point where people can't turn away. They, they've got to keep right. looking. And they've got to take action. And we know that now in COVID, in the times of COVID-19, um, which are making so many of these problems all the worse, um, states have every reason to look away because they have the pretext that they have you know, huge challenges at home, which are true, but but do not detract from the fact that here is a, a pressing series of human rights and humanitarian crises. And um, so I suppose there's, there's two things. I, I very much agree with Lou about the need for UN leadership to be clear, consistent, and, and urgent in its messaging about the need for um, Venezuela to respond to demands that it take action, but that other member states also channel political pressure um, toward um, outcomes 
that, that try to address some of the humanitarian crisis. And I think some of that is about trying to flood the system. So what I mean by that, and it, it, it sort of hooks onto what you said, Karina, how can we speak about the crisis using the portholes of different agendas within the UN? How do you introduce what you want to say with clear recommendations, but use different channels? Mm -hmm. And the, the beauty of doing that, even though it's resource heavy, right? So you've got to obviously decide, can you do it? Do you, how do you prioritize and all of that as a civil society player um, in collaboration with others? But how do we make sure that we're using every corner of the system so that we get to a point where the agenda or on the agenda is Venezuela human rights and humanitarian crisis. And that through that is one means of pushing the issue up and up the agenda to the point that the people at the highest levels cannot turn away. And you know, you, you're hoping that that starts to generate the kind of response that's needed. So I think it's sort of a series of different kinds of things, but um, um, yeah, there's there there we need to hear a much more committed and urgent message from from the highest levels. I think. Thanks. Thanks so much, Eleanor, <clears throat> and I, and that's absolutely um, that that's absolutely right. Uh, I think also that aside from what Lou was saying, that the the COVID presented um, the Venezuelan regime with an opportunity to inflict more repression and hide numbers and figures. It also presented it with an opportunity to wish and hope that everybody is too busy to remember Venezuela and to pay attention to Venezuela. So all the more need for, for, for those of us working and, and caring about this issue to put pressure on as you as you have mentioned. And, and that was a a huge coup that the that the fact finding mission was extended and that it will you know that that you can work around that that technical uh, construct. Would you have anything to add to this, Elizabeth? Thanks, Karina. Um, I, I think it has all been mentioned, and I I couldn't agree more with um, what Louis, um, Eleanor, and and, and Bibi said. I think again it comes back to the issue of um, you know in the case of Venezuela specifically, I feel like everything is politicized. And unfortunately, even the report of the fact-finding mission, which is an independent human rights body, has been politicized. And this, of course, comes to the really great frustration of many, many human rights activists on the ground. I think um, what it also comes back to, and it has been mentioned before, is that uh, states have a responsibility um, to respond to the humanitarian and human rights crisis. And it's not just countries in the region that have that responsibility, but it's also you know, members of the European Union, for example, the refugee and migration crisis um, has triggered, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans in imminent need of life-saving assistance and protection. And this is not something that the region can deal with on their own. So we need states who present themselves as champions of human rights, who present themselves as champion of, you know, protecting populations and responding to these crises to actually uphold that responsibility. Um, one more um, point that I wanna to refer to um, is what you mentioned, Karina, about the, um, the role of international justice mechanisms. Um, you mentioned the International Court of Justice. Um, the report of the fact-finding mission, um, of course, also touches upon the issue of state responsibility um, because it's the Venezuelan government that is responsible for protecting uh, human rights, promoting human rights uh, and for preventing violations. Uh, and is also responsible for investigating these violations. So in addition to individual criminal responsibility, there's absolutely that question of state responsibility. We have seen with other country um, examples that uh, you know states, when they are really willing to do so, can be very courageous in looking for creative justice mechanisms. We have seen that with the Gambia um, and, and the Myanmar case before the International Court of Justice. And we, of course, have a uh, preliminary examination of Venezuela happening at the International Criminal Court. I think um, the point I want to add at this stage is that in addition to these uh, big and, and absolutely fundamental international justice mechanisms, states really shouldn't just, um, you know, they have a responsibility to also look at other ways for ensuring justice and accountability. There's many ways in which you can do that on a national level. Um, universal jurisdiction um, is, is one example. So we should really um, continuously emphasize and, and push states 
to pursue different avenues of justice in accordance with their domestic legal systems to hold perpetrators to account. Thank you, thank you so very much. Um, and I think that that this whole issue of, of, of working in a multi-pronged way, um, like all of you have been saying, is extraordinarily important. And I would like to say also, and I'd like to give a shout out here to UNHCR. I don't know if everybody had seen it, but maybe we could post it here. I saw it just yesterday, a short vis video where they talk about it, refugees all over the world. They mentioned Myanmar, Afghanistan, um, Syria, and then they say, and what about Venezuela? And the question is, you know, that they haven't been registered as refugees. They, they only talk about 4.5 million, but there, there is, I mean, at least there's some leadership from UNHCR saying, you know, what about Venezuela? And this is the kind of thing that I think we need, we need more of, and we need to, to distribute everywhere and to let people know that, you know, this is a crisis that cannot and should be for, uh, forgotten, should not be forgotten. And it's only likely to get worse. Uh, and, and particularly that's where pressure from, from governments in the region would be extraordinarily important at the highest levels of the UN. If I could just um, uh, change over and ask Bibi a very direct question because we were asked, we were, and, and this is to the issue of women and women's participation. Just yesterday we were commenting, at least when I was growing up um, as a young woman in Venezuela, we had a lot of role models and there were a lot of women who represented us internationally and nationally as head of, as ministers and as, as wonderful diplomats. I had a lot as an internationalist, I had a lot of role models and we've seemed to gone back about 50 years um, despite you know, a woman vice president or a minister um, in the Chavez regime um, or head of prisons, by the way. Um, Bibi, what, what do you, what do you uh, attribute this to and how do you think we can go about changing this? Because even, even regrettably uh, within the opposition um, and in a lot of these forums where we're talking about the future of Venezuela, it's all male. Yes, um, I think that's why we are uh, doing this event and bringing to light to Venezuela the women's visa, uh, the women's visa security agenda because one of the uh, key points is understand the role that have to play women in in this process. And in Venezuela, it's not just all the affections of the human rights uh, of women and also the humanitarian. Is that we are not. Even we are uh, doing the leadership and resilience and brave in, in the, on the ground, that is not uh, the representation of the space who are making the decisions. And that's why it's important to remember our all parts and all actors, the important to bring um, and to include women in, in all the decisions. We see all the spaces, um, about uh, decisions, the crisis, international and national, uh, for 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 uh, all parties, the national assembly, the international uh, discussions that all the the panels are are conforming by males, and there is not a perspective of women in there, and there is not the understanding how the 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 crisis is affecting in a different way to women, and that's why we think that this is. This should be prioritized not just in the humanitarian help, our assistant, but also in the discussions to rebuild the democracy, and also for women's human human right defenders and civil society that is doing and is thinking how to uh, resolve the crisis in Venezuela. Uh, we have to do this this kind of awareness for for countries, for leaders, for UN also to understand and to not allow that we do have a, a table taking a decision without women. I think this is a, a, a important message that we can give with this reflection and with this plan, panel. Thank you so much, Bibi. And at least uh, uh, um, we should continue trying to work on this agenda for sure. I looked at the questions and answers and it's really commentary. And a lot of the commentary is actually um, from civil society um, in Venezuela expressing quite a bit of frustration, understandable frustration for the lack of help and what they say, what they see as not enough support for them, which is absolutely true. Um, but the only thing that we can do from our side, I guess, is to, you know, promise that we will continue in this, in this, um, in this struggle and in, and, and in this multi-pronged approach to 
to, um, to trying to make sure that the crisis is not forgotten, but rather dealt with. Um, we're nearing the end of, of this seminar. So if there's any other questions that you might, um, anybody would like to pose, if not, um, can I ask all of the panelists to give us just some final words, starting with you, Elizabeth? about next steps and where we go from here. Hopefully a hopeful um, ending. Yes, uh, where we go from here, uh, I, I really hope from my heart that we go to, to a peaceful um, solution um, to the crisis in Venezuela. Um, next steps, I think, um, and we've just touched upon this now, which is why I'm bringing it up again, because it is a key, a key issue um, that also we are facing in a lot of the conversations on um, how to respond and what does R2P mean. Um, it's so important to have these conversations and to continuously emphasize that we need to depoliticize the issue. Um, Karina, you mentioned this before, and, and I loved it. Um, it's not a question of left or right. It's not a question of, um, you know, whether you recognize one president or the other, this is about people, Venezuelans in the country and outside in imminent need of assistance and protection. And this has to be the priority for any stakeholder on any level. This is the um, perspective that we need to look at. Um, we need to continue investigations. We need to continue international scrutiny. We need to continue to keep a very, very close eye on the situation, but you know, simply reporting and simply having these investigations is not enough. There needs to be political will, uh, and that includes by member states, to actually do something with that information. Because some, sometimes, you know, in, in, in atrocity prevention and also in the humanitarian sphere, we talk about, uh, you know, lack of information and, and early warning and this and that. But um, as a matter of fact, all the information we need is here. Yeah. We have everything we need to know to respond. What is lacking is the courage and the will to act and for member states to say, you know, we are gonna respond. We're not gonna let the region deal with this on their own. We're not gonna, uh, you know, just ignore um, 5 million people which are out of the country. We're not gonna ignore that within Venezuela, hospitals don't have running water. Um, people are being persecuted. So we need courage and will and determination by stakeholders on every level to respond. and most importantly in making these decisions and looking at solutions again i think uh, we need to just stop and listen we need to listen to activists humanitarians human rights defenders civil society on the ground this is where the, this is where the solution lies this is where we can understand what we actually need to do and what we can do um, just to give one example, you know, general sanctions may sound like a good idea in a conference room in Washington, but if you talk to people on the ground who have to provide urgent humanitarian relief, they may tell you this is devastating. This is making it impossible for us to do our work and to save lives. So we need to listen and we need to listen to civil society organizations on the ground. I think this is key and this is how we will uh, understand what a holistic can look like. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, Lou, Lou, do you have any uh, sort of closing reflections? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I agree with uh, Elizabeth, what she just said now, that we need to keep talking. We need to keep the dialogue going. Um, we need to make sure that the issue isn't sort of thrust aside. And we need to listen to voices on the ground. Um, this isn't always easy because access is difficult, but um, you know, we need to keep trying it. We need to keep the pressure on. Um, and specific things, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, if the Security Council is going to remain paralyzed and there's no reason to think that that's going to change anytime soon, probably not in my or anyone else here's lifetime, um, bring the fact-finding mission to New York for an ARIA meeting, um, just keep having discussions. Um, and then, you know, let's have the Secretary General, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, everyone start working on growing a, a spine in a way um, to really uh, uh, keep the pressure on. There's this, this what, what 
um, in my view and what my colleagues and I think many others view is, is that the, the UN is often too timid in dealing with governments. They say they're worried about access, but what we've seen is that um, the Venezuelan government has not kicked the UN and the humanitarian agencies out um, uh, and, and you know, ended access because of pressure. Um, we've actually seen the opposite, that the government has sort of retreated in the face of concerted pressure and when people are speaking out. So we need to do more of that. Um, this is something that I know uh, different civil society groups um, have different views on, but we certainly at Human Rights Watch are of the mind that keeping things public and uh, you know, keeping the, the sort of language you know, tough and direct and fact-based is the way to go. Um, not politicized, but fact-based, tough, and not you know, leaving out details because we're afraid they're going to offend someone. Um, Carla's question was a really good one, a question in the chat, um, whether civil society pressure is enough. I mean, I don't think it's enough necessarily, but if it's all we have at the moment, we need to keep it going. Um, we need to keep the pressure on all the different actors, the, the, the governments that have influence, the United Nations, and then um, we need to keep speaking to the people of Venezuela so that we, they know that we're there speaking for them and that we have their best interests at heart. Um, okay. uh, that, that's, I think, where I'll end. We just need to keep talking about it as much as possible and not let it be forgotten. Eleanor? Um, thank you. I, I agree with everything said. Three quick thoughts. Um, I think talking is part of it, but but a but a talking direct with a with the purpose of defining what what next we need to do. How do we how do we try to engage with the system in a way where we're using our resources cleverly and we're trying to sequence interventions so that we keep applying pressure. And when I say we, I mean civil society ultimately. We are the driving force for this, but we need to persuade key states who then need to take action. So I think there's a first piece, which is um, further a moment, taking a moment to, dis to converse together about what what the strategy is from here on out. So that's one part of it. Secondly, I think there's opportunity. COVID-19 has produced um, conversation now and access to decision makers in ways that did not exist previously. And so now where previously it was hard to speak to person X, you can do that because they no longer have the you know, the pretext of not being available because you're not there in person, right? So actually, it's becoming easier, I hope, to create opportunities for Venezuelans to speak directly to decision makers. And, and that I need, I think we need to, um, we need to be facilitating as much as possible. Um, and my third quick point would be, as Elizabeth says, the fact finding mission has another two years of work at this stage. But we're not waiting two years to see what happens. Right, right, We've right. We've got the elements. We've always had the elements. And now we have the elements in the form of a, a UN uh, report that has now been supported by um, a majority of the council. And so there's a roadmap there. And so that now needs to be put, picked up by states. And we need to push for that to happen. Um, and, and we've got to figure out how to do that. Thanks, Karina. Thank you so much. Um, before I give the floor to you, Bibi, I just wanted to refer to a question, um, which I'm sure that you'll be able to uh, address in your uh, closing remarks. Um, and that has to do with uh, the terrible situation in the border regions and how do we do something more about that? And also, um, which of course has something to do, a lot to do with women, and that is the whole issue of trafficking, which I know is a huge problem. The trafficking of Venezuelan women all over the continent, actually, and in, in the Caribbean. Um, and before giving the floor, Bibi, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, I just wanted to, to respond to Lou when he said 
um, he talked about the issue of pressure and, you know, and Eleanor said flooding, flooding with infra technical information and hopefully making the SG and the, 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 the authorities at the UN, the higher authorities grow a spine. Um, I would say this is true of many member states as well. And all I can say is that in my experience, the best way to make people grow a spine is to make them incredibly uncomfortable. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to keep doing, um, uh, where they, they just, like Eleanor said, you cannot look away. If, you know, there's just, there's no other choice. And I think this is what you were referring to with what happened in the council with Venezuela. They just could not look away. So over to you, Bibi, for the closing remarks, um, since you're the instigator of all of this. <laughs> well, thank you, Karina. Well, first about the situation of uh, people living in Venezuela, I think, uh, as I said, um, those who are living right now are those who were left behind. And there are women and children and with the, the worst conditions. And uh, it's important to understand that they are not migrants. They are refugees that need international protection. And those uh, countries have to protect them and, and give all the guarantee of the, the rights. Um, and this is something that is gonna uh, unfortunately increase in the in this moment. We are seeing how people is living desperately in this moment. Uh, even we are uh, we have the the frontiers closed. Um, this is something that uh, all the international organizations and countries have to pay attention and respond urgently. About my my and also it's very important to focus on how there these are the effects uh, 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 threatening women and children who are very vulnerable in this um, in this uh, trafficking and 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 human rights violations. And for my closing remarks, remarks, I think uh, we have to see the multi-dimensional crisis of Venezuela through the lens of the peace and security agenda. And women's peace and security agenda is one a very important part of, of this work that should be done. And also this discussion between what happened in Geneva with all the work that uh, uh, we have been doing in the uh, Human Rights Council is important to have a reflection in the political uh, and uh, spaces in New York because um, we have to, we need this comprehensive response. Uh, we have the technical, but also have the political. It cannot be treated as in separate way. You have to be uh, together. And, and finally, and I think this is the, the, the proposal of this uh, uh, meeting, is understand that there's still people and women and many Venezuelans and from civil society and leaders working for, for the solution of, of our crisis. But we need the company of the international bodies and we need the company of the international community and the UN is crucial, uh, work is crucial and key in this work. Um, we have to work together um, and keep Venezuela in the agenda. We cannot uh, become uh, uh, in a forgotten crisis. Um, this is what I'm asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Bibi. I don't think anybody could have said it better, um, the, really. Um, in a nutshell, that's where we have, that's what we have to do and that's where we have to go. Um, our time is up and I just wanted to thank all of the panelists. It's been an honor to be here with you and to moderate this discussion. I would like to say that if you look at the chat um, uh, on, the, on the screen, um, this, this, um, web, this webinar is available on YouTube and the YouTube channel is there. Um, so without any further ado, I would also like to thank all of the CIPAS and uh, other colleagues who were helping us behind and our wonderful translator, our interpreter um, who helped us along with this. Um, so Louis, Lou, Elizabeth, Beatrice, Eleanor, thank you very much and let's keep at this and I hope to see you soon again um, on another panel or hopefully in person sometime soon. Have a good weekend everybody, thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Karina. Thanks. Bye. Thanks